Good evening. In the first letter of John, chapter 3, the 16th verse, we hear these words. We know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. So I wonder tonight, what first comes to mind when you think of the phrase, lay down your life for someone? I know that for me at least, I think of someone who has sacrificed their life for another or been willing to give their life for another. It seems like a pretty big deal, but how many of us have had the opportunity to lay down their life for another? Maybe there are a few in this room who have had the opportunity to risk their life for someone else. Perhaps there are a few who have served in our military or been in a situation where you just simply reacted in a protective way towards another. I wouldn't doubt that all of us in this room are capable of some type of heroic act and that maybe a few of us have even had the chance to act upon it. But I also wonder, who would we lay down our life for? As a mother, I would lay down my life for my children for sure. And I like to believe that given a situation or circumstance in which some type of rescue was necessary, that I would in some way react to the situation instead of sit by the sideline and panic. But would I lay down my life for a drug dealer who I knew wasn't going to change their ways? Or a friend's husband who cheated on her with someone we all knew? Or even that annoying neighbor who looks at me funny every time I mow the yard? Maybe we should start with the verse 18 of our biblical text today. After we hear that we should lay down our lives for another, we read, Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in action and in truth. Love becomes something we do, not just something we feel. But what does that look like? Well, I'd like to share a story with you tonight. I've learned a great deal about love from both of my parents, to be honest. But tonight, this story is about my father. While I was growing up, my dad served the uh, San Antonio Independent School District as a middle school and high school counselor. And his last years, he spent developing an alternative educational program that allowed students who had dropped out for a variety of reasons, including pregnancy or jail, to re-enter school and finish. And I can recount in my growing up years at least a half dozen stories shared at the dinner table of him Uh, doing things like breaking up fistfights at school, or one time he drove his car into the middle of a gang of kids in the back of the school after school was over. They all had lead pipes, and they were about to beat up two girls, and he drove his car right into the middle and told them all to go home. One time, he walked out into the parking lot to find two young men face-to-face, one of whom was a student who was trying to get his life back in order and had returned to school. The other boy had pulled a switchblade, And so my dad stepped in front of the student and calmly directed the boy to go home. And so the young man turned around and left. All of these heroic acts were done out of love for the young people he served, but I believe he also loved the young people whom he stood against. And he didn't want them to ruin their lives by following through with their violent deeds either. But the the story I think shows the most loved of any of the others, came just a few years ago. After retiring, he became what is called a court-appointed special advocate, or CASA volunteer. These special volunteers are trained for two years to work with social workers, child protective case workers, families, and the court to speak on behalf of children who are taken from their homes, placed in foster care, and have basically become uh, into custody of the state. The volunteers meet regularly with the parents of the child for supervised visits. They meet with the social workers, the CPS CPS staff, and they even go to court when it's necessary for the child. They meet with the judge, they meet with the foster parents, and most importantly, they get to know the children. It is the job of a CASA volunteer to be sure that the child does not fall through the cracks of a system with so many voices, so much turnover, and so much challenge. And over the time a case is in process, which can be two years or more, um, the circumstances, the, the, the uh, social workers, the lawyers, the foster families, all of that can change. 
So the constant for these children in these cases is the CASA volunteer. So you can imagine how protective and loving these volunteers feel about these children. And you can also imagine how my dad must have felt after two years getting to know his first case, a sweet little girl named Diamond, who was taken from her mother at four days old because she was, the mother was addicted to drugs. So when the court decided to let her go back to her mom, this was against the recommendation of the foster families and certainly of my father. He knew the family, he knew the mother's struggles, and he knew she wasn't ready to have the little girl back. But she had done all that was required by the law. So the court ruled in her favor. And then it happened. Within two months of Diamond's return home, the news story hit. A little two-year-old girl had been beaten to death by her mother for wetting her pants. The city was devastated and horrified, but no one was as brokenhearted as the foster families who had cared for her and loved her over those two years, or the man who had served two years as her advocate. He was powerless and he could do nothing to save her, and he was angry. It took a lot of convincing from his favorite judge in the court system to keep him as a volunteer after this happened. And he finally agreed, but only because Diamond had siblings that had not returned home. And so he worked for several more years as their advocate until they found loving, adoptive families. But this isn't the end of the story. Last summer, I led a workshop on justice issues, and I asked my father to come speak about what he did for CASA. And in that time with him, I learned what true love for someone else really is. He told the group about Diamond and how much it had killed him when she died. He talked about wanting to quit, and he talked about what it was like to continue, but then he surprised us all. He talked about Diamond's mother. He shared a story about a woman who had spent her life caught in systems that showed her no love. She had also been abused as a child. She lived in poverty. She was addicted to drugs. She had been part of a broken family system, part of a broken community, and part of a broken court system as well. This woman had never been given real love, much less taught to love. And when her daughter was given back, she reacted out of life experience and her own pain and inability to cope. And so he said all he could do was forgive her. That's right, he forgave her. In spite of her horrible crime, an act that ended a child's life for a ridiculous reason, in spite of the fact that she was a terrible mother who couldn't get her act together, somewhere deep down inside, my dad was able to look at her and feel compassion and love. He was able to lie, lay aside his hurt, anger, bitterness, and judgment and simply say, I see that you are a person of value who has never been told you are loved. I am sorry, and I forgive you. Jesus laid down his life for us so that our sins may be forgiven and we may have new life. Perhaps what it means to lay down our life for another is to set aside our own judgments, our own prejudices, our own hate, pain, and suffering, and even our annoyances and to truly see the value in another. When we lay down our life for another, we say that we are willing to give up something of ourselves for them. We are willing to love them in spite of their humanness and in spite of our own humanness. Our gospel reading today says that the Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. His sheep know him, and he knows his sheep. And the letter from John in verse 20 says, God is greater than our hearts and God knows everything. We are just like the sheep. We do stupid things. We get lost, we follow the wrong crowd, we get stuck, and God knows it all because the good shepherd knows his sheep. Pastor Greg gave us a perfect example this week of some sheep at a family reunion who got himself stuck in an outhouse and hours later were unable to get free. Late in the day, it was the shepherd that finally freed them by calling them out, setting them in a new direction. 
And just so, Jesus calls us out, frees us from our sin, and recognizes us as his own truly beloved, truly valuable creatures. Now, the story I shared a few moments ago is a pretty extreme example. It kind of reminds me of some of the heroic deeds we talked about at the very beginning of this sermon. And perhaps we don't always have such an example in front of us. Or maybe we do. Maybe, in some ways, it's harder to forgive the daily things. Maybe it is harder to find the value in someone in our everyday living For example, the noisy roommate, or the gossiping friend, the person I just can't talk politics with, um, or the loved one who has yet again left all their dirty socks in the living room, the guy who's driving five miles per hour under the speed limit in front of me, or the loud, abrasive woman at the grocery store who can't control her kids, can't find her coupons, much less a card that works in the card machine. What do we say about the drunk asking for a handout or the banker who saves all his money and spends it only on his needs or wants? What do we say about a friend who we suddenly realize disagrees with us or has hurt us and doesn't see how? It's really easy to move on sometimes, isn't it? Find new friends, pass the slow driver with a few choice words, brush off the drunk because we are really powerless to help them, Relationships are broken and we walk away because it's hard to sacrifice ourselves for each other. But our campus ministry theme this year is abide, to remain or stay. Once again in tonight's passage we hear from uh, 1 John, and this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. To abide is to see the value in another. To abide is to desire relationship even when it's hard. To abide is to love one another and lay down our lives for one another. And to abide is to recognize that Jesus lays his life down to say that each one of us has value and is worthy of love. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. It takes a great deal of sacrifice to love another, but this is what God has done for us. God has loved the unlovable. Jesus has laid down his life to forgive our sins, and we have been called by the Holy Spirit to do the same. Amen.